As we all know that cyber attacks on critical infrastructure are no longer a hypothetical threat. They are a growing reality. From manufacturing and energy to water and healthcare, the systems that we rely on most are increasingly under siege. Secure is a critical infrastructure overview 2024 report dissects over 1,700 cyber incidents revealing the most vulnerable sectors, the tactics that threat actors are using, and the systematic weakness putting essential services at risk. In this episode of Secure by Design, we break down the report's most pressing findings with Kiran Chinna Gaganagri, co-founder and chief product and technology officer at Securin. We will dive deeper into exploring the key attack vectors, emerging threat trends, and protective measures that organizations must take to fortify their infrastructure. Kiran, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much, Vapnil, and nice to be on the show. Since this is our first conversation and the first time someone from Securin is on the show, I would love to learn a bit about the company's history and story. As a co-founder, can you share when and why Securin was created? I mean, the cyber security space is highly competitive. It's a crowded space. So what gap did you see that led to the creation of this company? Predominantly what we're looking for is, there, like you said, there are a lot of companies that are in the security industry and there's crowded marketplace. What we are looking for is how do we proactively, and the keyword is proactively, help organizations be prepared and secure their infrastructure. Um, our roots are in the research. Um, we work very closely with universities. Two of the universities that we have a really good tie up is Arizona State University and New Mexico State. And some of the research work that we are doing, like, you know, came actually was through funded through DARPA Naval Intelligence. This was some grants that we actually worked closely with the US federal government at that time. And we were trying to bring in all of that into the product. And the core idea is, you know, just like, you know, in a physical war, how do we look for threats and any risk associated with cyber infrastructure? And if we can proactively give that warning to the customer, that would actually help them be better prepared for it. Um, we are very proud that typically we're able to give a warning, early warning sort of to say about 30 to 45 days ahead of time before a particular vulnerability or software um, bug is going to get likely get weaponized or is exploited in the wild. And that gives them enough information for a customer to be able to do the um, whatever they need to do, like, you know, put a compensatory control patch a system, decommission system or whatnot. And um, the company um, has been, you know, in, um, I would say like about five years ago is when we found it. Um, we had some roots, you know, before to more on the professional services, but about five years ago, we took a really hard look and said that, you know, we need to start looking at this from a very different angle. Now let's talk about your latest critical infrastructure overview 2024 report. Is this the first time you folks have published the report or you have worked in the past? Let's just start with the, the motivation, the idea behind this report. Um, we've been doing every year. We do actually different reports. Um, ransomware report is something we do every year. This year we said, hey, why don't we look at from a very different lens? You know, what are some of the big risks that are in the CISA 16 sectors, right? You know, that's what you know we looked at and said, hey, you know, maybe we should do a separate report this year, focused on these critical sectors, and that's the crux of you know why this report came out to be. So this is the first time we are doing the sector-wise reporting. In the past, we did a very holistic one. This year, we looked at, you know, how do we divide this into the 16 sectors and, you know, what it means. Now, let's dive into some of the key findings of this report. What are the biggest cybersecurity risks affecting critical infrastructure today? And uh, as you mentioned that you have been doing this report for a couple of years. So also talk about the patterns, the trends that you have seen evolve over years. Yep. So a couple of things, you know, we looked at is um, the from a 16 sectors. When you look at it, the most um, sectors that were vulnerable are the manufacturing. What we saw is that you know there was a steady increase in the number of vulnerabilities in manufacturing sector, more than 3,000 vulnerabilities in software related to manufacturing and robotic devices are affected by this one. 
Energy is the second sector that we saw a huge jump, almost a 30% increase when you ask like, you know, patterns, right? We saw increase about 30% from the prior year in 2023, a significant jump in the number of vulnerabilities and exposure. And in the last one, I say not the last one, but the third one we saw is around water and waste, about 800 vulnerabilities in industrial control systems. Again, these are some of the key areas or sectors we saw a significant increase or the number of vulnerabilities that have gone up in over um, you know the past years the other thing that we kind of noticed you know from a pattern perspective of is um, there are two or three things that were really interesting one was the threat actors or ransomware groups are focusing on smaller entities you know typically it used to be in the past you know larger entities they used to go after but there was interesting trend we saw this year that you know they were going after the smaller entities and then the other one that we are looking or at least tracking is the geopolitical side of it um, a lot of the um, changes that are happening on the politics are also impacting like who is attacking who and what is happening i would say your report highlights vulnerabilities across various sectors. Which industries are currently most at risk and how has this landscape evolved over the past few years? Are you satisfied with how critical industries are handling security or you see there is still a lot of scope to make things better? I think you know twofold. I would say um, if you look at from a very data centric perspective, so you know we are looking at nation states like you know Russia and China and Iran, like you know looking at sectors that are like energy sector, the water systems, right, and also financial sector. I think you know these are some of the, and healthcare. I would say that you know that's another one. So these are the four critical sectors you know organizations should be paying attention to. Um, and then when you look at from ransom for groups right these are folks that are looking for making money right you know not necessarily looking for hey you know i'm going to take a critical infrastructure like a water utility down or energy right they're looking for more money so they're going for you know high targets you know where financially right so healthcare again is one and then finance sector is the other two right you know these are folks like black hat and logbit you know these are very pre um, prominent you know ransomware groups that you know we are seeing so from that perspective I would say that you know those are the four um, particular um, I would say sectors you know that are really really interesting for us to pay attention to. Cyber threats are constantly evolving. As I say, cyber security is not a destination. It's a journey. It's not a product. It's a process. If you look at this whole cyber security space beyond traditional attacks, how have newer factors such as you know geopolitical changes and the rise of technology like gen ai impacted cyber security are attackers becoming more sophisticated or are unsophisticated attacks are still causing the most damage I don't think the attacks are changing as much. I think what we're seeing is predominantly the more or less the same in these sectors. One of the things, Sapnil, you know, when we looked at, and it was interesting for us, you know, like unsophisticated attacks are the ones that, you know, CSA is saying that, you know, are still the most prevalent one. What it means is that these attackers don't need to actually spend a lot of time you know, you can actually take a very easy exploit and deploy it because there are so many systems that are vulnerable. Now, when we look back and say, why is that case, right? So think about, you know, energy and, you know, um, critical infrastructure, like, you know, water and utilities, right? These are legacy systems and it's very difficult because you have the IT and OT systems, right? You know, you don't have a patch manager, you don't have an agent on it, you know, it's very un difficult to understand, you know, which ones is patched and even if it is, if you ask an agency or organization to go and patch it, right, you know, they're not going to just push it like, you know, doing it on a desktop or a laptop, right? It's very different type of infrastructure. And these systems are there for so many years, 20, 30, 40 years, and probably even before you and I were even born. So they're legacy systems. So that's the first one. So which means when you have a legacy system, you know, your passwords, right, or credentials are probably even hard-coded or the default passwords where they cannot change it. You don't have the typical 
luxury of putting a two-factor or a multi-factor authentication on these devices because again these are legacy devices right you're not able to patch these systems and bring them up to um, the latest norms or latest pack updates and all of it because there's so many of it and you know you don't want to disrupt you know the existing system so what all that means is that you know the first one that we looked at is like you know vulnerabilities and misconfigurations are the number one attack vectors in fact energy and water is where we saw a lot of these because there's a convergence of it and ot in the last decade or so where these two um, you know, systems are converging. That brings in a lot of interesting attack angles for, you know, threat actors or ransomware groups. The other ones is the legacy system. And then the second attack vector we're seeing is simply the phishing type. You know, again, like you said, you know, they are becoming very, very sophisticated. You know, the average time it takes for somebody to become a fall for phishing attack now is about 60 seconds and you know, gone in 60 seconds, right? Um, then you have the compromised credential, like we talked about. These are old systems, so maybe they're hard-coded, maybe the default passwords, again, you can do MSA. So that's the third attack vector we are showing. And then with the convergence of IT and OT, now we're also looking at exposed public applications, like publicly facing applications. In the past, they were behind, now they are being exposed to it. So I would say these are the, at least, you know, the main one that we saw, and we went through all of these in details, you know, by sector, in, if any of your audience is interested in going through the report. It's easy to put the blame on the other party and say, you're not doing a good job with the vulnerability management or um, doing a patch management. What we have to do is, you know, take a little bit of empathy and understand that, you know, do they have the enough team, like, you know, structure, like, you know, to make these patches. And a lot of the times, public sector especially doesn't have enough resources, you know, to do the job. You know, you have 10 people, maybe an organization, managing thousands of systems, and you can't look at every single you know, signal that is coming in because you just don't have the manpower. Whereas the bad guy has every intent, you know, to look at one particular vulnerability, two vulnerabilities, and, you know, all they need is to be successful, just one, right? So they are going to be having a lot more patience and a lot more interest. And so it's just that. Um, and the second one is, you know, these are legacy systems where upgrading these systems is going to take a ton of time and also it's going to take a lot of effort and so unless you have some infrastructure funding to upgrade these legacy systems it's going to be very hard because that is just going to be the status quo you can put bandits every single day but you know it's just going to be and then the last one is you know like i said these are unsophisticated attacks that we are seeing. CISA also has confirmed it, and also they are going with, again, smaller organizations. It used to be larger, but now even focused on smaller entities. So how do we empower these smaller organizations, especially because for smaller entities, they don't have the wherewithal. They may not have the right resources, may not have the right awareness, they may not have the right um, you know, pieces in, you know, to detect it, right? And also those are areas I would say that, you know, we have to focus. And it's something that we have to work collaboratively between a private sector and a public sector, you know, to make that happen. Many organizations, especially smaller ones, struggle with security due to limited resources. What practical steps they can take to strengthen their defense from a solution perspective, from a cultural perspective, from a process perspective, how can securing help these uh, organizations? What I would say is, you know, most organizations should be prepared for some day that, you know, they will either get breached or, you know, they, they will get attacked. And so resilience is something that, you know, most organizations need to look into. What we feel is that 90% of organizations don't have incident response, don't have detection capabilities. It's not a service security and provides, but, you know, honestly, what I would say is that that's like, you know, the number one thing, like having a mechanism to understand, like, hey, do I have backups, right? Just, to, you know, the bare minimum cyber hygiene, like make sure that my backups are kept offsite. Let's do a disaster recovery exercise, you know, every year or so, right? You know, those are the ones. Um, I think, you know, organizations, if they have those, um, you know, DR exercises or operational readiness in case of a disaster, I think that is going to be the number one. Where, you know, securing can offer some solutions is like before we even go there, like 
you know, honestly, first organizations to understand what is my entire attack surface, internal, external, if I'm in cloud, you know, what is all of it? And second is, you know, am I able to correlate these signals, right? You know, if a hacker is able to see that I have a specific tech stack running and there's a vulnerability and if they're able to exploit it, right, you know, how, how do I get the same visibility? And then from there, you know, is a hacker able to get into my environment, right, and then do a lateral movement or privilege escalation to get my crown jewels, right, or any other asset in my organization. So how do I take my external, how do I connect to my internal, and then how do I bring in any of the other uh, information pieces that I have? That's one. And if I'm a software development organization, how do I make sure that my staff, right, who are right, my developers or engineers are doing a secure coding, right? CISA has done an amazing job at coming up with the secure by design principles, and so organizations need to focus more on it. Those are the areas I would say securing can absolutely help in terms of, you know, giving that external or a hacker's view, being able to take the information from multiple different sources, internal, external, you know, either your cloud or whatever it is, and your application and cloud, and bring all of it together. Together. So that provides that adversarial view. And on top of it, you know, we have our adversarial intelligence, which gives you that early warning saying that, hey, all this information is something we can provide and correlate, but also we can give you a warning with our adversarial intelligence, you know, a month ahead. So organization can now look at, hey, I have 30 days of warning. Let me start doing my dev QA environment, you know, patching and upgrades and testing. And then before I go to my production. Now you folks have just uh, published this report and we have the whole year ahead of us. What cybersecurity trends or challenges do you anticipate in the coming years? Are there any upcoming research report that you folks are working on? Just, just give us an overview, what is in your pipeline? So a couple of ones, some interesting ones. So we are working on creating our ransomware report, which is the yearly one that we're doing. But this year we're also taking up one more, which is around Gen AI. Um, especially looking at the different models, large language models that are out there as organizations are using it, being able to understand the risk of, you know, deploying a specific LLM into their organization, whether it's a commercial or open source, understanding that, you know, one of the things that we came up is what's like a nutrition facts. When you buy food stuff, you have this nutrition facts, like hey, what's inside the food. We came up with a very similar concept of, you know, AI risk facts. So there is a label associated with each of the model, whether it is, you know, open AI or Llama or Mistral or D Seek, you are able to look at the AI fact sheet, understand what the risk of, you know, using this model is, right? I'm not saying that, you know, models are bad. No model is good or bad. You just have to understand, you know, what is that model is going to give you that. So that is a um, report that we are working on that will be published, you know, in the near future too. I think Thank so. Thank you, Kiran, for sharing your insights on cybersecurity and the critical infrastructure overview 2024 report. It was a pleasure chatting with you today, and I look forward to talking to you again. Thank you. Absolutely, Swapna. It was a pleasure and being on this uh, on this uh, on the show, and uh, appreciate the opportunity.